All right, here we go. I'm here with Ron Gilson, who I consider to be the most accurate historian in Gloucester because there are other historians that have come and gone that like to talk about the fanciful fantasy land uh, of, of what the fishing industry was, but they really weren't involved in it. They speak from an outsider's perspective. But Ron, you fished on the adventure, is that true? I made one trip on the adventure in 1951, in February of 1951, and the reason I did that was that I recognized that that dory trawling industry, which was on the wane in 1930, was definitely about ready to meet its final demise uh, sometime in the early 50s, and true to form, uh, in 1953, the adventure was finally retired. The reason being that there were no men available that would even uh, uh, partake, if you will, in that type of a livelihood. Uh, uh, my good friend Lou Nickel uh, once told me that uh, born and brought up in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, the first part of his life, and fish, fishing out of Gloucester uh, his entire life, uh, Lou Nickel told me at the time that, you know, dory trawling was all that they knew and, uh, and it was the only thing they could do. So for that reason, it became a way of life for them. But the young people in the 40s and the, even in the 30s with the advent of diesel engines and, uh, and modern uh, vessels at that time and modern methods of fishing, for the United States, the outer, by that I mean the outer trawl business, which was uh, which was well uh, established in Europe uh, in the at the turn of the of the 19th century, that business was coming into its uh, its heyday in the 30s with the advent of the diesel engine. So between the new methods of fishing uh, uh, coming into the industry and uh, the old men retiring from, a, from an obsolete uh, method of fishing, dory trawling. And the uh, new methods were what? Uh, trawling? What's that? The new method was trawling? The mo new method was, we call it outer trawling or dragging, if you will. And that was, that was made possible with the advent of the modern diesel engine. So. So all of this came into being, um, uh, in, into maturity, if you will, in the 1940s with, with, uh, with larger diesel engines and different uh, uh, design boats and so forth. And of course, you must understand that in that era, and I write about that in my book, uh, An Island No More, I consider that to be the, the Daring, stunning, diamond in the crown uh, uh, role as far as fishing goes. Uh, that was the uh, that was the paramount era in in the in the in the history of fishing in Gloucester. Why do I say that? Because we in in 1945, 46, 47, 48, 50s. We had a fleet of uh, 250 vessels. Uh, probably a hundred of those vessels left Gloucester and fished in the Nova Scotian banks and in, as far uh, east uh, uh, to uh, Newfoundland and the Grand Banks. And they brought home there was large bodies of fish. They, the fish were readily available, and uh, the fish were all over the ocean. We had and we had the vessels by the end of World War II, by 1950, we had the vessels, we had the men returning from the war, and the demand from Europe with the Marshall Plan, the city of Gloucester fed European nations, the recovering nations of the world after World War II. We were instrumental in supplying a major portion of the protein uh, that was needed for these starving countries in Europe. They were devastated. We had the product. We even sent vessels over to Europe to teach them how to fish. I'm reminded of the super beam trawler, the Pan Trades Andros, that uh, was sent to Greece to teach the Greeks how to fish, and that was returned to our returned to our shores back in the in the late forty late forties, and it became a member of our fleet. It's a large vessel, but primarily. 
My uncle Charlie, I remember him saying, you know, people would talk they talk about the schooners as if that was the heyday of the fishing industry. I remember my uncle Charlie always saying, those guys, they didn't catch a thimble compared to when the, the, the like when my grandfather's time when they when the, the diesel engines were. were I'll were, give you. Yeah. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. The whoever said that is exactly right. Uncle Charlie. Your uncle Charlie. All right. Frankie's Let's father. take a typical schooner in the twenties. The heyday of the schooners, the ones where they talk about the sailing and the captain's courageous image and all of that business. A very romantic era. Romantic if you don't have to participate in it, but not so romantic if you have to go. Yeah. Understand, one of these vessels, a hundred foot, 110, 130 foot vessel, brand new out of Essex in, 19, in 1921, took two or three weeks to get fit that vessel out for sea because there was no engine involved, only sails that were made prior to the launching. So the vessel left in June. It fished June, July, and August, came back in September with 300,000 pounds of salt codfish. Three months? Three months, 300,000 pounds. Now we'll take, <clears throat> in 1947, um, uh, the Benjamin Captain C. Joe Shemantaro in the yeah. Benjamin Sea, about 104 foot long. She had the state-of-the-art 400 horsepower Atlas diesel marine engine at the, the best of equipment, New England winches, New England galluses, brand new nets, the top-of-the-line electronics for those days. Joe Shemantaro would run the mail. That's a slang term for meaning that you could time your watch by the way this guy landed fish. And every 10 days, he was at the wharf with 200,000 pounds of redfish. Every 10 days. He left on a Monday. He sailed Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock, Tuesday at 2 o'clock, Wednesday at 2 o'clock, he was setting out on the Grand Banks. 960 miles. 24 hours a day. Four days he steamed. Figure it out. 10 miles an hour. 900, that's a thousand miles. He would arrive there and his friend, Captain Sam Favaza, I mean, uh, Nicastro in the fishing vessel Felicia, another super vessel built at Dana Sturry's yard along with the Benjamin Sea, launched after the Benjamin Sea, a little larger, a little more horsepower. Sam Nicastro was already fishing when the Benjamin Sea arrived. The two of those would fish in tandem. In two days, they would load the vessel up. In the Benjamin C's case, 220,000. In the Felicia's case, 250,000. The Felicia had been on the banks a, a day earlier, or four or five or ten hours earlier. They would fill up earlier. The Benjamin C was at the end of his trip. The Felicia would set out one extra set and pass the net to the Benjamin C, the two of them would, both loaded, would start for Gloucester. Two days later, they would arrive at General Seafoods and take out. They did this like you timed your watch. All right? 20, 20, in those days, it was figured that you had to do 24, 25 trips a year. All right? The Benjamin C and the Felicia always made that commitment, always did it, and for for years, they were the, some of the top producers in the city. In terms of production, in terms of volume, dory trawling, salt fishing, halibut fishing, all those modes of fishing that were, were uh, uh, depicted and written about in John Morris's book uh, uh, about alone, dory fishing. Alone at sea. Alone at sea, yeah, good about, yep. uh, go, about dory fishing, they're penny ante compared to this. There's no time and no period in the history of Gloss's fishing where we, this city, has handled four and five hundred million pounds of fish annually. No time except the period from 1945 
until 1951 or 52. No other time. So in that respect, it was the heyday of Gloss's fishing, and these vessels, that, the vessels that landed fish in those days, and there were many of them, Felicia, Benjamin C., Kingfisher, Curlew, Catherine Amaral, uh, Mary and Josephine, Mother Anne, you can go on and on and on. These vessels were landing horrendous amounts of fish. We couldn't have done it without those vessels. And another important ingredient, we couldn't have done it without the longshoremen, the stevedores, and what we call in Gloucester, the lumpers. If those vessels 